they repaint the deity, and then they do rasya. So what do you do? We yeah. study. Studying? Studying, yeah. What do you study? Uh, writing a thesis on the Bhagavatam. Is it? It's uh, his relationship with science, Darwinian science. Darwinian science is really under, uh, it seems like it's on the slide, you know, almost. Not yet. We saw this really cool, uh, what was that video that we saw up there? About intelligent design? I think it's following him. So Darwinian theory is still pretty, uh, pretty people think. It's attacks from other directions, but still pretty rooted. They're not necessarily directions that I think we would find favorable or advantageous for us to understand. Just a different a different uh, form of uh, naturalism. You know, the, the, the basic idea that we saw in this video was that, that they that they analyzed the, the cell and so it showed such huge complex arrangements in it, you know, it's ultra super multiplied magnification. Yeah. It was all called irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity, yeah. Yeah, that which it, it implies intelligent design. Yeah. That and, it would which implies metaphysical influence from some yeah. some higher intelligent being. It, it had a promising start in intelligent design, but it hasn't really gained the support from the scientific community that they were saying it would. Because they say that you don't need intelligent design in order to get irreducible complexity. All you need is very gradual steps. Yeah, but that was their whole... The well, presentation we that we saw beginning. proved yeah. clearly that gradual steps are not possible. There's no way of... Yes, they are. That's the response. Do you still have that video? The hell? I uh, Maybe somewhere. Because that would be cool for him to look at. I've seen a lot of them. I mean, I think maybe you've seen this one. Where I'm was it made? Was it an American one? Maybe or? America. I'm friends with the leaders of that. William Dembski. Michael Bay, hey? Maybe. Uh, I mean, we just looked at it like one night, like three and a half months ago. I don't remember it so okay. well. I'm, I'm going to plan on writing a book with No, but, uh, but the okay. point is that, anyway, it seemed convincing to me. What the Darwinists say is that, well, the, the, the organism they, they harp on is the bacteria flagellum that has this. Yeah. They say, well, that rotor could have been used for something else other than the locomotion and that you can build up a rotor-like device for other purposes. But and why? Then, uh, they think that it was used for puncturing into other bacteria and sucking... Who would want to do that? That this, this bacteria... What would make them want to do that? They could get some nutrition out of the other... No, but where did the original conception come from that there should be something for puncturing another bacteria for sucking plasma out of, out of another bacteria? I wanted to say that it doesn't come from anywhere that... It's uh, everything is just trying to survive, and and it the, the organism will just pick up and it'll use whatever it has to survive, and that will that will change over time. It's it's uh, suppose you need like a particular thing in your room to survive, like um, like you have a stove that keeps you warm during the winter. And if you don't have the stove, you're going to die. And you originally were burning a certain thing, and then you find out you can burn something else, so you start burning that. If there's no plan, it's just you're taking whatever you can from your environment to survive. And, uh, so then what's the solution? What's the answer to that? To respond to them? Yeah. Other than that they're left to their own speculation. I mean, Prabhupada more or less just shuts it down by saying that the conditional defects of an illusion soul mm -hmm. cannot possibly come up with the truth about anything, no matter how they approach it from whichever angle, because they're seeing it through imperfect senses and through uh, a mind which is dependent on imperfect central perceptions and whatnot. Therefore, we have to throw that out as a plausible process for arriving at a proper conclusion or a perfect conclusion. Yeah. Therefore, we have to accept higher authority. Scientists will never do that, though. Unless they're a little intelligent and can understand the utility of that argument. The way I'm approaching You're it. You're just attached, that's all. They enjoy it. The way they enjoy thinking about... Well, there's a lot of things going on that... 
the way I'm approaching this is trying to cut away all the different motives that one might have to do in science and addressing their arguments, which are Darwinism is very hostile to you. And uh, I'm trying to address the theory by asking what's really the point. I mean, what's really the point of doing science, guys? Why, why do you do it? Is it? In the end of the day, is it really what is life really about? And what is the world really about? And what is, what is it really about to be a human being in this world? And does science address those? Does Darwinism really address the problems that we face as human beings? And, um, well, according to their idea, that just as it's meaningless, the only meaning is physical survival. Yes. So, therefore, the meaning of life is physical survival. Reproduction, training, passing the genes on to your children. And uh, somehow or other, getting all the gusto you can get. Because yeah. it's just a, a temporarily manifest organism anyway. Yeah. So, therefore, it's basically a meaningless affair. So, your question of what is the meaning of human life is irrelevant. What is the purpose yeah. of life is irrelevant. There's no purpose. Purpose, yeah, there is no purpose. There's no real purpose. Yeah. It's, it's just happening because it's happening. Yeah. Not because there's any reason for it to be happening. Yeah, there's nothing behind it. There's no mind. There's no God behind it. It's just, uh, oftentimes, those sciences, they'll give the veneer of a sophisticated philosophy, what appears to be a sophisticated scientific view of nature without getting in, without drawing these, these conclusions. So at least if somebody draws up and really says, this is what, if someone can say, this is what you're committing yourself to, a very meaningless, purposeless philosophy that actually defeats itself. It defeats the whole point of even doing science. Why should you work hard? To why, why bother with it if, it's, if there's it's no so meaning hard. to it? Yeah, well, it's so hard. Yeah, science is hard work. You want to you you work hard to prove that there's no meaning to your working hard? It doesn't make any sense. So I hope to point out some of those things. And draw some parallels between science and the Bhagavad Gita. Points of some con- points of contact between our approach to reality and their approach to reality and conclusions that have been drawn. But won't they see, you know, because people see what they want to see, they'll probably see so many dissimilarities also. Yeah. Parallels that may be there if you look at it in a certain light. Yeah. You know. I think there's some distinct parallels in real. Yeah. You know, yeah, some genuine parallels. Even the whole notion of Darwinism about the struggle for existence, natural selection, which is fundamental to Darwinism, like Prabhupada, a few words in the Bible on the Gita chips and like, uh, I can't remember the exact Sanskrit word, but he, stru- he translates as a struggle, hard struggle for existence. That's Darwin's terminology. So I have a section of one chapter where I try to show that the way Darwin, Darwin talked about the struggle between organisms, the war between organisms, constant competition, struggle, strife, selfishness, um, lack of resources, competition for those resources. But that's discussed in the Bhagavatam. Part of the general Indian worldview, any Indian region. And to me, that's a way of deflating a lot of their prestige that they have about that. They feel that they, scientists, are the white, you know, British scientists, American scientists, who discovered this truth that human beings have never understood before. Struggle for existence. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to demonstrate, no, it's actually here. And, and they had a whole different way of dealing with it. Man. But then they just discredit the antiquity of the, of the literature itself. Yeah. That's not my field, but... Yeah, they're trying That's to what they'll do in various ways. They're devoted to dressing that, too. Yeah. Devoted to Dweta, who just wrote a really good article showing that the Bhagavatam guy got to be at least uh, 500 years A.D. Which was Almost 2,500 years ago, or something like that. Yeah. It was most dated in about 1,000 years ago. That's the general view right now. 
1000 AD? Yeah. The Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. How could they come to such a ridiculous conclusion? Uh, it's, it's a really great, it's stupid art. Well, they do it through Madhav and Dupuri. They think it's coming, um, the Bhakti is coming from South India, from the Alvars, which they date around 900 AD. And, um, yeah, but it's, it's, not, it's not a very good argument, but it's taken, this guy, Friedhelm Hardy, a German Indologist, who wrote this huge book called Viraha Bhakti. Viraha Bhakti. Viraha Bhakti. Yeah. And it's huge. Well, he's definitely is separated from Bhakti, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly, probably they would, they would just kind of like brand you as a moralist. It's a matter of picking out the cool, pious people on the... I see it as more or less creating a movement within science. Mm-hmm. A movement within science. Yeah. Not convincing everybody, but convincing small groups of people yeah. to then get together and confer and create ideas and then pass that knowledge on to younger generations and then... So that at least some contingency is aware of the yeah. fallacy of Darwinian theory. Yeah, and that's in the philosophy that underpins it. And then, but my view right now is that there are a lot of people out there who are pretty dissatisfied with it. Yeah. And that, there are, yeah, there are. It's, uh... So it's just a matter of if the contingency becomes large enough to large. have the strength in numbers, then more people will speak up. Yeah. More people join How much is it handicapped people? by, uh, you know, um, or how much would, you know, how much would it much perhaps be aided by uh, Christian groups wanting to put forward it, um, you know, the Christian dog mixing the Christian Christian yeah, dog yeah, in other words, the the Darwinians. Thing, you know, they don't like us. All mixed they in. don't like us any more than they like the Darwinians because a lot of them are, are Protestant fundamentalists. Yeah. I talked to one of them. Uh, what's his name? Philip Johnson, and he said, "Oh, you Hindus, you don't even believe in right and wrong." <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't believe in right and wrong. It, yeah. And uh, it's like uh, yes. Hindus do believe in right and wrong, and he he wouldn't even hear it. And then he was like, on the, either it's a, yeah, it's on the next fanatical. Side. Yeah, they don't really want to. I I wanted I am friends with another one, a guy named Glenn Dempsey, and he wanted to fund my work through this. They're connected. They've got millions and millions of dollars, actually. And he wanted to fund my work, and he applied to the institute that's behind Intelligent Design Theory Discovery Institute. And uh, they're like, no, we're not funding India. <laughs> so, it's, uh, this is one of the reasons why scientists have rejected religion as part of the metaphysics of science, because it, it's led to these sectarian uh, conflicts over things that are beyond experience. <laughs> then let them we'll sort that out later yeah. <laughs> let's address the basic issue yeah. they want to ignore that because they don't want to deal with it if they can dismiss it somehow then they don't have to deal with it so in order to dismiss that they uh, prefer to accept something which doesn't uh, consider the two points of view right. maybe it's just a problem with Christian metaphysics Christian theology because it's not scientific enough <laughs> So sectarian, yeah. yeah. Jesus is the only way. Yeah. Whereas no Hindu can say that. But uh, I feel positive about it. There are people, religious people, and sort of just spiritual people, who are mm-hmm. looking for an alternative worldview. You think we might see Darwinian theory uh, fall in our lifetime? I think so, but not not in a way that. Not, not, not in the crash, but a gradual erosion. What's coming up now is something called self-organizing complexity theory. Self-organizing complexity theory. It's the notion that, uh, well, they're looking at the protein fold and all the amino acids in a protein fold. Well, if you get the amino acids together, a certain combination of amino acids, which are the building blocks of a, of a protein, proteins are the building blocks of a cell. 
it just sort of comes together naturally in the same way that a bubble when you blow soap through the thing it naturally forms a bubble it just naturally forms a, a perfect sphere it's because of the properties of the matter or a crystal you know you get, you get the right materials together and it crystallizes it naturally forms that angular shape and the protein fold seems to do the same thing so they're, they're looking at other things other parts of the cell segmentation and you know, worms and things like that, you know, things, I think things self-organize, which is very different than what Darwin said. But it doesn't allow for there to be any such creator or higher, you know, intelligence behind the thing. It might. Some people feel it does. They feel it. Does? God created matter such that it, it, uh, I think it's in some, I think we can find some parallels in our situation. So it does admit that there's an yeah. ultimate, um... Most people behind it are, are like, uh, spiritual people. I mean, the main guy that was behind it was in the 1920s, a guy named Darcy Thompson. He was like a Jewish, and he started off his book, his main book called Form and Function, with a quote from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it says God um, created all things in his mind and then he implanted them into matter and then they they bore they bore out of matter like they came out of matter like seeds trees come out of seeds God put the seed of all things this is more or less like the similar to the watchmaker philosophy quite it's different it's a little similar cool isn't it the watchmaker makes the watch and he sets it in the motion and then he doesn't have to worry about it. No, that's different than that. Does he, does he still have hands-on management? Not necessarily, but I think it, it's different than the watch. They, they're totally against the watch metaphor. They say the metaphor we need to use is a crystal because a crystal forms by its own. You get a very complex, beautiful form just by the properties of the matter that make it up. They're salt crystals. Salt crystals form into almost perfect cubes. And it's just because of the, the chemistry of the uh, interaction of the chemicals within this salt. But, the, 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 the question is, is it who has made matter, that way? Made matter to be like that yeah. so that it does that? Yeah. How is it that matter just happens to be like that? Yeah. What they also find is that what they call an attractor, which I find really interesting. They found that, say the protein pool, they, they call it the shape it takes. It's a very beautiful, complex, three-dimensional shape. It almost looks like a flower. And um, they found that it will make this form from a whole bunch of different pathways in the same way that you might come to this room, if your room had more entrances and things like that, you might come to it from a whole bunch of different ways. And that your room would be like the attraction. And so they think it's, it's sort of like an idea, that there's this idea behind it. That's attracting matter to form a particular shape. So and I think that's similar to ideas. Kind of like mind over matter. Yeah. Which we believe that forms are Brahma. He goes into, at the beginning of creation, he goes into this meditation. In the third canto, he talks about how he goes into this uh, meditation of Jnana. And Jnana from the Vritti Rodha, and controlling the modifications of his mind. He, so then he sees the Veda, and then on the basis of the vision, he creates the universe. So, uh, I think maybe there's some parallels between the notion of, of an idea. I mean, the Veda is in the, in the form of an idea, sound. And then creation happens through that. So maybe there's some, some parallels there. there. There has to be an admission of consciousness. Yeah. I mean, consciousness as being above and beyond matter, with, rather than being created by yeah. 
material elementary configuration of it's, some it's sort. A, it's a totally different paradigm in Darwinism, where Darwinism says that mind, consciousness, uh, volition, will, it's all built up from matter. Whereas this self-organizing view says almost the exact, exact opposite, that complex organisms, the forms of this world, are built up from pre-existing idea or mind. So then we have to, we have to, <coughs> I think probably the key word mm. is self. When we say self-organizing, mm. self, you know, can refer to, but where's the original self from which any of it became organizable? Yeah. You know, it's like self-organized, like if you take a crystal or if you take the material elements, are we to accept that the material elements are the self, which is self-organizing? Organizing means organization means there's got to be intelligence because otherwise chaos. Yeah. Prophet very often gave that argument that without intelligence there must be chaos. So there has to be some kind of intelligence behind the organization. So it's the intelligence which would be said to be the self of the, the organization within matter. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. But is there a possessor of the intelligence, a consciousness? Yeah, that's a good question. And yeah, so then that would have to be established in order to bring it to a level wherein conscious entities who are above and beyond the material manifestation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which Science would be an integral part of the whole affair. Yeah. Science at this point won't even address those questions. It's just uh, they're questions which other people think about. So. My view is that even if Darwinism is defeated, then you, it doesn't mean that, that the ethos of science is going to change. They still may they may accept some other materialistic yeah. view of nature, which there's plenty. I'm sure that there's plenty of other views they could go into. So what I think is we have to start thinking about the ethos of the world view of science is couched in, and um, that's got to change. That means trying to convince atheists to become theists. Yeah, or at least trying to convince the theists that are in science to not tolerate atheistic dogma doubting all science. At least get them to start saying no, we don't want to do science with you anymore. We want to start asking a more important question. <laughs> well, then don't be a scientist. Be a psychologist. Or, you know, but then it's just getting rid of the problem. And they say that that may just be an obscure branch of science. Science is about finding the truth. So why mm -hmm. not uh, start asking questions which might give you more truth? Why push it to some other discipline? We can, if science can address it. And what I, uh, the, the reason I think science is important to address these is that uh, it's become the dominant means of defining reality in Western, in all civilizations, particularly Western civilization. It's the main uh, paksha for anybody that it, that's there. That's it isn't part of science. You attain the same status as the Veda as in India. So it's definitive. And Darwin is the main giant problem. It's so rare. And he's, he's the, his, his views have become the, um, the root of the ideology and philosophy and, and politics, psychology, sociology. So that's how people are defining their lives and the, the way they understand themselves, their relationship with nature, with God, cosmos. If they accept reality. 